Hi, welcome back to AP Inventory from Dustin Fowler. I'm going over some of the Unit 2 basics today. We're looking at population and migration. In particular, we're going to spend some time understanding the population and why people are where they are in the world. And we're going to transition into migration or studies of where people go, and for what purpose do they go, and what are some of the motivating factors behind their needs. For starters, I want you guys to know a little bit about the reasons why people might move to wherever they are. The reason why people live wherever they are. Well, we gotta think that for the first time in human history right now, probably about since 2011 or 12, somewhere there about, more people live in cities than anywhere else on Earth. This is the first time that the rural population has been less overall on a global scale than the urban population. So what is it that's leading people to move and live in cities? Well, several things you gotta think about. First of all, physical factors including bodies of water, uh, modes of transportation, uh, whether or not it's accessible to other people because cities are in fact centers of interaction uh, that can help people from a cultural standpoint and also to spread their economic influence. Basically, we human beings don't like to go places where it's too hot, too dry, too cold, too wet. So we tend to take the path of least resistance like anything else. And we go to places that are comfortable for us, like Goldilocks and the bears, right? We like the small bears bed because it's best for us. The places that are going to be the most comfortable for us as human beings, in particular in the developed world, is going to be places where we can buy stuff, where we can interact with other people, where we can live a good quality of life. So we're looking for good schools, we're looking for a good job. All of these things are going to be found in places where people are, not kind of out in the boondocks. You know, so we're looking for places that are going to be located in cities. Well, traditionally, the reason why your best land, the reason why your water and all that is going to be uh, places where we are most likely to urbanize is because, well, these are the places where the food is. These are the places where things are accessible. And so it really makes sense that we're tearing up all of our best, most arable land for the sake of urbanization. But it also goes to explain a little bit more about why people locate where they do, which is kind of what we're looking at. So aside from just physical factors, basically what I'm seeing is that there are also human factors that have a uh, place in history, a uh, place in politics. Uh, basically, we don't want to be in places where there's a lot of war. Uh, uh, maybe a civil war might be a reason why we might want to leave and go somewhere else. And then what if we liked where we ended up? We're going to stay there for a long time. So you can look at history to help explain why people are still in places where they are today. You can also look at things like famine or food shortage that leads people maybe to migrate to another place. And so these are all reasons that we are going to study the human and physical factors that help determine where we're going to live. Some of the most basic things that we need to understand in order to be able to tell and, and interpret where people are on Earth is to understand what we mean by population density. Now, it's important to note, and I mentioned this in a previous video in Unit 1, is that you've got arithmetic density or the raw numbers of people in an area. You can apply arithmetic density to just about any phenomenon you want to track in a location. But in terms of population, we're looking at the amount of people living over the amount of land in the area. So the United States, you would take the amount of people living in the U.S. divided by the amount of land area, and that number is going to be the population density in the United States. But there's two other ways you want to look at population density as well, and that is a physiologic density and agriculture density. Physiologic density is going to be the amount of people divided by the amount of arable, that is, farmable land, land that's suitable for agriculture. Your agricultural density, I messed this up in the last video, is going to be the amount of people divided by the amount of farmers. And so both of these numbers here help to understand a little bit about the country's capacity to feed itself. All right? If you have a large number of people to every small number of farmers, chances are, unless you're, you're seeing like a massive amount of produce created by a, a small number of people, like maybe you do in the U.S., then you're going to start seeing, uh, well, maybe they're importing some of the food um, and maybe they're exporting something else in exchange for that. So it tells you a little bit about the economy and also maybe about the development of a country whenever you see uh, uh, large numbers of people for those statistics. Also, I want you all to be aware of the idea that population isn't always evenly distributed. If you guys look at um, a map of the entire world, maybe it's a dot map, maybe it's showing you where people are located on Earth, you can see that in China and in India and you know, the Southeast Asia and South Asia quadrants, you can see that there's more people living in those areas than basically anywhere else on Earth. I mean, you got over a billion people, right at somewhere around a billion people living in India and about a billion and a half people living in China alone, to give you an idea where the third most populous country on Earth is somewhere around 330 
a million people living in our country. And so the populations are not evenly distributed at the country level, nor is it evenly distributed at the world level. And for this reason, it's kind of important to also understand what we mean by a concentration of population, all right? So basically, there are gonna be four key areas where you're gonna see the most people living on Earth, and that is number one, East Asia, number, uh, which includes things like China, things like um, uh, Korea, the Koreas, the Japanese, right? You also have South Asia, which is gonna be your India, your Bangladesh, your, your Pakistan. You've also got uh, the European countries, which is gonna be somewhere around a billion people. And then you've got your Southeast Asia, which is gonna be like your Thailand, and includes Indonesia, which is the fourth most populous country on Earth, also the largest uh, concentration or population of Muslims on Earth as well. In the United States, the majority of people are clustered over in the New England area in the Megalopolis region, which is basically continued urbanization along the northeastern coast from DC to Boston. So basically, we are distributed all over the Earth, but we're concentrated in various places within the Earth. We don't use even close to all of Earth's land because most of it is uncomfortable for us or uninhospitable. By the way, the word for the, the, that describes the land that we do use is called ecumen. It's a word you need to know, so know it! I also think it's important that we all know that there are a lot of different types of information that are, are I guess, implied by large population. For example, in countries with large population, you gotta figure out how to administer healthcare. You gotta figure out how to redistrict in the United States, for example, for the sake of trying to figure out fair congressional districts based on population. So census data and all these different things. So there's political implications as well. You wanna make sure you can provide services and infrastructure to support population. And so if you have too many people, that can cause major problems. Let's look at one of those major problems. Let's say for a second that every one of the 7.34 billion people on Earth all of a sudden was driving automobiles. Well now, you wouldn't see just the United States using up most of the world's gasoline. You would use basically everyone to be engaged in something that's going to uh, make us have to share better our natural resources. So we don't have the resources to support everyone driving or everyone using energy the way that we do. And so what this does is it points to a term you need to know called carrying capacity. In other words, either at the global level or within a country or local level, if you have too many people, then the area that your people are living in aren't, isn't gonna be able to support them. There's not enough water. Maybe there's not enough other resources for energy or fuel, or maybe there's not enough housing. And so carrying capacity is something that geographers study, in particular, when we're looking at demographics. Not to look too far into the future, but when we talk about industrialization, we're gonna learn that really the, 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 the jobs that were made available due to industrial centers in some of your cities within the, uh, the UK ends up uh, causing people to move in there in droves. So people start leaving the rural countryside and going all up into the city. So I think working in these textile mills. And what this did was it caused people to move in way too fast. And so the housing was crummy. The, the sanitation was really bad and poor and the cities were basically unplanned. And so there was a huge amount of just unbelievable pollution. It wasn't livable, it was nasty. And some people were talking about sludge, oozing up in the in the you know in the, uh, uh, the floor out uh, of the concrete and kids rolling around in it it's crazy stuff we also want to kind of understand that when we talk about population densities and where people live on earth there's really a, a whole mix of different things that can or different variables that can be included in this demographic approach for example you have people of different religions that might live predominantly in one area like in the middle east most people are going to be Arabic and most people are going to be Muslim, but not all of them, but most of them. In the United States, you've got a large chunk of Baptists or Protestant Baptists and other Protestant groups living within the uh, southern states and elsewhere. Uh, you see where different religious groups and different ethnic groups kind of cluster in certain regions and they stay there for whatever reason it might be. You've got the majority of the second largest minority group in the United States, the, your African American group living predominantly in the south. Uh, Hispanics tend to live predominantly along the Texas and Mexico uh, border area because that's closest to Mexico and Latin America. And so you see where different people tend to cluster in different regions based on demographics and ethnicity at a large scale. Also in a local scale, you might see where people do this as well. 
mainly because, well, yeah, in certain neighborhoods where you might see uh, whole Jewish neighborhoods, for example, in New York City, you might see where they feel more comfortable and more culturally together when they're united. There's nothing wrong with that, right? And so these are all some of the reasons why you might see where people are clustered by religion, by language that they speak, or by ethnicity. And then finally, we need to know that over time and across space, you see where populations and densities and, and different groups living in certain areas are going to change over time. We don't all stay in the same place. And not only that, but populations are going to grow. Just like we saw populations start to grow in Great Britain during the 1750s and the Industrial Revolution, population has not slowed down ever, ever since. I recommend that you go on YouTube and look up the dot video so you guys can understand how population has consistently changed over time and how it doesn't seem to slow down at all. Part of the reason why people do start you know, living longer, especially during that period of industrialization is because, well, people during the Middle Ages and even probably into the Renaissance were having tons of kids. Like they were having on average five or six kids per couple, but they expected that basically all but two of those kids were going to die, which is pretty sad. I'm about to have my second kid to go find out tomorrow what my kid's going to be. All right? If I thought that there was a chance that I was going to lose my kid, man, I'd probably cry myself to sleep tonight. It's really, really sad, but eventually, because of advances in, in standard of living and eventually um, the medical revolution and all that, we have more and more people living. In other words, at birth, the child mortality rate is going to decrease. Infant mortality being zero to one, child mortality being one to five. Odds were, if you live to 12, you were the minority during the Middle Ages, but eventually more and more people are going to begin living as children into adults. And what happens when mom and pa have five kids and all five of them live? Now you've got exponential population growth. And this is part of what uh, sparked that exponential population growth during the Industrial Revolution. And part of the reason why today, in your most developing countries, your poorest countries on Earth, like most of Africa, for example, uh, you're going to see how rapidly their population is still expanding but in places like the United States and Europe and, and Japan and Australia and your other developed countries the population is starting to slow down and even decline in some places. We're going to talk more about population pyramids and a demographic transition in next few videos. Hope I was able to give you guys a basic introduction to the study of migration and population and the human jargon. If you like what you're seeing, subscribe to my channel. See me on Twitter. Ask me anything you might have in the comments or on Twitter. Let me know what you think. Thank you very much for your time.